All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the session. This is session two uh, hello. of machine learning on cloud and auto ML. Right. We decided that we will do auto ML, explainable AI, and uh, auto ML. Okay. Uh, just give me a quick minute. All right. So let us uh, proceed further. Yesterday, we started off with auto ML and we also understood that even without writing a single line of code, we can accomplish machine learning algorithm, right? And as part of that, we discussed that hyperparameters can be optimized. Neural architecture search can be automatically performed. Feature engineering can also be automatically performed. There is also something called as meta learning. Meta learning is all about learning from the results of your model. So not get uh, deep into that. At a later point of time, we'll look into what is meta learning, etc. The first question which arises is, Automated machine learning, auto ML. Does this mean end of the role of data science or end of the role of data scientists rather? Answer is no friends. Automated ML can only do so much. First of all, you need to understand what is a business problem, right? The business problem has to be documented. Automated ML cannot help you with solving business problems or identifying business problems automatically. It cannot do that. So we as humans should identify the business problem. So human intervention is still needed. Number two, data collection. To a great extent, what data has to be collected? What features do we need for our model building? For all these things, we need human intelligence. We need human brain, right? For this data collection as well. And for feature engineering, for feature engineering, if you want to apply your domain knowledge, then also human intelligence is needed. For example, just as an example, suppose you have two columns and, and you're trying to predict vehicle breakdown. The output variable is, will a vehicle break down or not? Okay, so will a vehicle break down or not say this is the output variable that you're trying to predict and you have certain inputs inputs are how old is the vehicle how many kilometers did the vehicle travel right say these are all the various inputs and also you have a couple other inputs one is latitude Another is longitude or longitude, however you want to pronounce that. Usually people will feel that number of kilometers driven or how old the vehicle is and number of kilometers driven are very important, but latitude and longitude really does not make sense in predicting whether a vehicle will break down or not. But then, if you have your domain knowledge, experience of working in automobile industry, then you would say that I am going to use latitude and longitude. And given these two, 
I would try to come up with a new variable called as location. Based on location, you can figure out whether it is a hilly terrain or whether it is a desert. If it's a desert, maybe vehicle might break down because of overheat, so on and so forth. Okay. So this is not end of data science, right? Auto ML or automated machine learning is not the end of data scientists. Automated machine learning can only automate a few tasks where a lot of human effort is invested. Okay. However, understanding the business problem, collecting the right data, performing right feature engineering based on the domain knowledge, all these things are very important. And here you have automated ML. Automated ML can only solve toy problems is what people think. One myth that we have demystified is uh, you should not think that auto ML would end the role called data scientist. No, it will not do that. And the second assumption is that automated ML can only solve toy problems, not really. Identifying the right neural network architecture or identifying and you know looking at all the various hyperparameters is not a small task by any means. Right? It's not a trivial task. So automated ML is also solving complicated problems. There are a lot of you know open source platforms and tools such as Microsoft NNI. Uh, we have Auto Scikit-Learn, SK-Learn, Auto Weka, Auto Keras, we have Teapot, Ludwig, Auto Gluon, Feature Tools, so on and so forth. Out of all these things, I'm certainly going to walk you guys through and um, you know explain you all about um, Teapot. Okay, we are going to do hands-on end-to-end using Teapot. Okay, and we shall also use at the high level something called as feature tools, right? We shall look at both of these. These are from open source platforms and tools point of view. And we will not use deep learning. See, friends, uh, when it comes to machine learning algorithms, you have two things or two branches rather. One is traditional wherein you have a bunch of traditional machine learning algorithms, such as decision tree, random forest, uh, linear regression, so on and so forth. And on another side, you have deep learning algorithms. Okay, you have deep learning algorithms. When it comes to deep learning algorithms, uh, we are going to look at something called as autokeras. After we explore these, uh, we will also look at how do we deploy the models in production? That is yet another thing that we shall look at. A lot of people know how to build models, but they really don't know what should we do after we build the model. Where should I go and deploy the model? Okay, we shall also look at the deployment aspect so that the entire pipeline end-to-end -end is understood. Next, we also have a lot of commercial tools and platforms, meaning you need to pay. Okay. As part of this, we have Google Cloud AutoML, you have Data Robot, you have SageMaker Autopilot, Azure Automated ML, obviously AI, H2O, driverless AI, and bunch of things. Okay, we have a bunch of additional platforms. However, we are not going to look at all of those. Okay, we are going to look at only these three. Google, AutoML, SageMaker, Autopilot, and Azure Automated ML or Azure uh, ML Studio. Okay, we will explore all these and we will 
theoretically understand the concepts and we shall also practically solve the thing right but while i mean until we get to this stage you have to just wait a bit because once we understand how the pipelines are automatically built then when we look at automated solutions on cloud you will be able to easily understand okay and what's happening behind the scenes okay next so friends when it comes to entire data pipeline machine learning pipeline or data pipeline whatever you want to call it you can also call it as machine learning pipeline these are the various phases that we have you'll have data ingestion data ingestion means getting the data from various sources maybe you have your hr department which stores the data in sql database your hr department maybe you have your sales department which uses some kind of a crm maybe it uses customer relationship management uh, database from zoho okay and maybe you have some other department which stores the data in a simple excel file microsoft excel and you have data in three different data sources data ingestion means getting the data from all these different sources and then try and then you also try to get only the appropriate variables from these uh, you know databases and you ingest it that's called as data ingestion once you get the data from different sources you need not always have the data which is which can be readily used to build models on top of that a lot of data cleansing is needed a lot of data preparation is needed a lot of data pre processing is needed we do all of that and then we take the prepared data and then supply it to our model when we build a model you need to choose between uh, two things or, or rather yeah two two broad things one is are you building a model in the field where there is a lot of um, you know regulatory norms if you have a lot of regulatory bodies regulatory norms to be abided like banking if you reject a loan you need to explain why you rejected the loan if the customer comes back to you and says hey why did you reject my loan can you explain me if you if if you fail to explain in certain countries you can be sued your bank can be sued okay. to <clears throat> avoid that you will use explainable models so you end up using regression models or decision tree models etc that that's one thing that you need to look at before choosing a model second thing is what is important performance or accuracy sometimes people might say hey you know there is a big basket which is e-commerce website where you can purchase vegetables say you're searching for tomato along with that you know big basket will recommend a few other vegetables now there more than accuracy speed is important you want those recommendations to happen immediately all those should i mean you want all those to appear on the screen recommendations immediately right in that case you have to use a model which will give the results faster as opposed to building some kind of ensemble models okay we also have something called as ensemble models which will give you very good accuracy but then it will be slower so it's not always about accuracy friends it's also about the business requirement right so those are the aspects that you need to consider then you train your model and then you evaluate and figure out which is the best model and once you figure out what is the best model you deploy the model in production 
but while you get into this modeling phase choosing the model training the model evaluating the model a lot of experiments can be performed and that is the area where people usually spend huge amount of time you take all your prepared data or features supply it to your modeling phase in the modeling phase you have model selection model training and model evaluation you have three different things you select the right model you train the model and then you evaluate the model while you evaluate the model if it is deep learning then you also look at neural network right you look at all the various neural networks and you try to search for the best then you also perform hyperparameter tuning you try to change the different options with a neural network algorithm and keep experimenting with that and uh, until you get the right model once you get the right model you deploy it so those steps which are listed in the dotted uh, window are the steps which are very time consuming these are very time consuming tasks which can be automated and these includes automated feature engineering automated model selection and hyperparameter tuning then we also have automated neural network architecture selection your auto ml can automate these steps okay next as i've told you i'll i'll spend quite a bit on the theory because once you understand the theory when we do practicals it'll be walk in the park for you all right so i uh, once again you have this data pipeline wherein you collect the data you clean the data as part of your data preparation as part of feature engineering you perform feature extraction feature selection and feature construction then as part of model generation you select the right model then you perform hyperparameter optimization when you perform hyperparameter optimization you might want to use randomized search or grid search or bayesian optimization or reinforcement learning or evolutionary algorithms or hyperband there are a bunch of algorithms which exist and finally you evaluate the model as part of model evaluation uh, we have early stopping low fidelity surrogate parameter shift bunch of things i mean we'll not get into uh, finer nuances or details of each point here because that would defeat the entire purpose of the session otherwise yeah so automated hyperparameter tuning is all about learning the different hyperparameters for the model right and um, sometimes this gets bundled with the learning of the model itself and it forms or becomes part of the larger neural architecture search and this is called as full model selection or cache combined algorithm selection and hyperparameter optimization and nas is also known as this neural architecture search nas is also called as automated deep learning because ultimately if it is neural networks then it is deep learning only right so from that point of view. next this is how we have you know a bunch of techniques automated model choosing and hyperparameter optimization when it comes to hyperparameter optimization you have a technique called as grid search what happens in grid search friends when it comes to neural networks neural network algorithm you have a lot of hyperparameters such as you have something called as learning rate we have something called as dropout um and and uh, you have various other things like number of 
hidden layers, number of neurons in the hidden layers, activation functions, uh, batch normalization. I mean, you have a bunch of things. Out of that, we are only taking two for our understanding. Suppose you have two options of learning rate, which is 0.1 and 0 0.01. You want to experiment. What will happen if I choose learning rate as 0.1? What will happen if I choose the learning rate as 0.01? Okay. And you also have dropout. You are interested to understand what if I do, or what if I select dropout value as 0.2, or what if I select the value as 0.5? Okay, so here you, your model, when you do grid search, it will try out all the combinations. When I say it will try out all the combinations, what I exactly mean is it will take 0.1 learning rate and 0.2 dropout. Learning rate 0.1, dropout point. And it will build one model. Then it will choose learning rate as 0 0.01, dropout as 0.2. And with that setting, you build the second model. Then you choose learning rate as 0.1, dropout as 0.5, and then you build a third model. Then you choose learning rate as 0 0.01 and dropout as 0.5, and then you build a full, full, you build a full model. In this way, you try out multiple models with all the combinations. Here, since you have learning rate with two options and dropout with two options, you'll, you'll experiment four different varieties. And then you will choose one model, which is the best. Now, rather than do it manually, all these experiments, you can make use of a technique called as grid search, which will automatically try out all the combinations of hyperparameters and the options of the hyperparameters. And then it will give you the best result. But sometimes, since this is called as exhaustive search, meaning it will search or it, it would experiment with all the combinations. If you have more levels in your uh, you know, hyperparameters, if you have here, we have two. Instead of two, you can also have 20. Here also you have two. Instead of two, you can have 10, 20, whatever. So then the number of models that have to be built will just explode. Like huge amount of time. Hence, people came up with something called as random search. This is very, very similar to grid search with the exception that it will not try out all the combinations. Randomly, it might select one, two combinations. Randomly. If you have four out of that, randomly two or three, it will select. So it will be faster. Because it is faster, it is also called as cheap. Because it will complete the work faster. So it is cheaper for you guys. Okay. But then it, it won't be as uh, good as grid search because grid search does all the permutations, combinations and gives you the best result, right? But random search will only randomly choose a few. Then we also have Bayesian search. Okay, this is yet another technique based on probability to decide what is the best model. Uh, so it will build randomly certain combinations. It will build models using some combination. Say it uses learning rate and dropout and randomly it builds a model. And then its goal will be to keep reducing the loss or keep increasing the accuracy of the model. So it will keep tweaking the hyperparameter such that the accuracy is maximized. Then we also have something called as hyperband. Hyperband is a very, very new technique now in the world. And a lot of people are trying to use hyperband. Okay, next. This NAS we already discussed in a, so I'll just skip this part. NAS is neural architecture search, which will help you figure out whether 
given your data, fully connected network or your multi-layered perceptron, should that be used? Or convolution neural network or recurrent neural network, etc. And then it will figure out the best model. So that's it. So I'll uh, skip this part. And uh, I would recommend highly that you guys read this NASNet, which is learning transferable architecture from sizable uh, image recognition. Just, you know, you just go through it, read it. And uh, NASNet generates models for you. Okay, it will actually generate different models for you. And these models often outperform state-of-the-art human design models. If you are manually doing the models, if you're manually building the models, then be rest assured that NASNet generated models will be much superior, much better in terms of accuracy and performance. Next, we also have something called as AmoebaNet. Since nowadays, what is happening is people are just increasing the number of parameters that the model learns. And uh, we have AmoebaNet, which is one of the you know, amazing uh, revolutions in the space of image classification. Okay, and uh, it's giving amazing results. And uh, that too, with far fewer resources. When you have far fewer resources, you can try out Amoeba and it works wonderfully well. Okay, next thing is, the number of parameters are exploding because of the processing power, because of the compute which is available. When I say compute, I'm talking about RAM, I'm talking about processor, etc. These terms are important, friends. It is very important for you to remember the terms. So if you have more RAM and more processors, you can have more uh, weights. You can have more parameters. More the number of parameters, better will be the accuracy. And the, if you look at the highest accuracy models, those models with more number of parameters are winning the race. Next. So, automated feature engineering. Uh, we will look at feature tools for that. Autom automated model and hyperparameter search. For that, we are going to look at teapot. Okay, and automated deep learning NAS neural architecture search for this, we should look at auto keras. Okay, and then uh, rest of the things are for your uh, quick glance. Yeah, of course, we'll not have time to look at everything. Okay, one more thing. Oh, one more term rather that you need to understand. Once you have your data set for analysis, you have candidate feature generation. That means you generate a lot of features from the data. Then you rank your features and then you select what are the important features for you. This part is actually automated big time. This is called as feature selection. You figure out what are the various features that you have. You rank them in the importance, in the order of importance, and then you select the right features. Next. Every model that we're going to build has internal parameters and external parameters. Internal parameters or your model parameters, as people call, are internal to the model. That means if you look at a neural network architecture, for example, you'll have weights, weight, weight. All these are weights. All these are weights, okay? And finally, you get an output. 
and combination of all these weights will give rise to a weight matrix. Weight matrix is something which is internal parameter. And then you have something called as external parameters, which are outside of the model, like learning rate, number of hidden layers, batch size, so on and so forth. All these are external parameters. And your hyperparameter optimization will deal with your external parameters. And it will try various combinations of learning rate, number of hidden layers, batch size, so on and so forth, and give you the best results. Okay. So, yeah, these are the bunch of tools that we have, uh, which are all related to AutoML. And we already know what we are going to explore, right? We are going to explore Teapot. Autokeras from this entire plethora of uh, models that we have. And then we are also going to look at feature tools. Okay, yeah. After this, uh, I think we'll get into teapot. So quickly, two more slides before we jump into that. Auto ML or auto AI is a process of automating the entire pipeline, entire data pipeline can be automated. And another goal of auto ML or auto AI is to democratize machine learning or deep learning to non-data scientists and non-AI experts. What does that mean? Data scientists will anyways use machine learning models. AI experts will obviously use machine learning models. We are aware of that. But can I help a lay person? Maybe, uh, for example, can I help a doctor, physician, use machine learning without they having to learn far too many things? can I actually ensure that within one day, people who are non-technical folks start using machine learning algorithms. Can I do that? Yes, absolutely. When we look into hands-on of AutoML, you, uh, uh, SageMaker uh, Autopilot, you'll simply be blown away. We'll get there eventually in the fourth module or fifth, fifth module, we'll get there. So you'll have a lot of questions to answer before uh, you get started on any project, a lot of problems to be solved. So you'll have a lot of questions to answer. You first go and acquire the data, go collect the data that is needed for your analysis. Then you perform data exploration. Right? You perform exploratory data analysis. Then you prepare the data pre-process the data, clean the data, remove the outliers, deal with the uh, you know, missing values, et cetera. Then we perform feature engineering. Once you're done with this, the model construction phase begins, wherein you select the right model, you train the model, and you tune, perform hyperparameter tuning. Once this is done, you go ahead and deploy your model in production. Once you deploy your model in production, people can use the live data or the real-time data or the actual data. Okay, and they can supply this to your deployed model. And once you supply to the deployed model, you get the predictions. This will give you the answers, obviously. Okay, fine. Next thing. So in automatic data preparation, we have two main aspects, data cleansing, data synthesis. In data synthesis, data synthesis means if you have less data, you try to generate more data. Say you have images. Uh, say you have radiology images. 
Uh, let me show you how a radiology image looks like. Just a uh, quick understanding. Radiology. Here we go. Okay, this is how the radiology images appear like. This is all, uh, these are breast images, radiology images to determine breast cancer. Okay, if you want to determine breast cancer, those are the kind of images that you need to deal with. Usually when you want access to radiology images, you'll have only limited images. You will not have huge number of images, only a small, set of images is what you're going to have. But if you have only a small set of uh, data, I mean, if you have say 3000 images, you cannot build deep learning on such small data set. It won't give you good results, even if you try to. What do I do then? You synthesize, you augment, you try to get more data from the existing data, how? So say these are all the images, what you can do is you can rotate the images. If the image is like this, say you have a human face like this, then rotate it. How? You can rotate it the way you want it. Maybe you rotate it like this by say 20 degrees or uh, clockwise. You can also rotate 20 degrees anti-clockwise. You can flip the image. You can do many things. By doing that, you'll have more images which will be generated. Even if you try to just rotate the image by 20 degrees, for these 3000, you'll have another 3000 images. Okay. And then we also have feature engineering in which we have feature selection. You select the most important features. You construct, you come up with new features and also we have feature extraction. Uh, usually when you use automated feature engineering uh, to extract the features, then uh, you, you can use traditional models also, no doubt about that, but usually people use deep learning models, which has this automatic feature engineering capability. Then you have automatic model generation, automatically different algorithms are selected, different hyperparameters are chosen uh, and grid search or random search or Bayesian, any of these is applied. Then you have uh, NAS, neural architecture search, ENAS, uh, genetic programming, evolutionary log algorithms, bunch of these. Then we have hyperparameter tuning, when you tune the hyperparameters, Okay, once again, here is a snapshot of different auto ML, um, you know, frameworks which exist and what technique do they use internally is also something which is known. Like Bayesian optimization, or what technique it exactly uses. Now, here we go, teapot. So there are four levels of automation which people usually uh, resort to, right? One is basic automation, wherein you take, suppose you are manually recording the uh, electricity uh, details. For example, you will have an electric uh, electricity meter, right? And uh, do you remember the good old days when someone from the electricity department would come, they will look at the readings on your meter on how many units you have used and then they will charge you accordingly. Manually, they used to do that. That process has been automated to a great extent now. It is being automated. So this, this is some basic automation. Entire process also can be automated. Okay, for example, say a particular uh, uh, patient okay, goes to the hospital and takes an appointment. Okay, manually they usually do that, right? You, you either call or manually you do it. Then 
patient will go talk with the doctor physician and then doctor is going to record the entire details on what disease you have what is a medication on a piece of paper that's called a subscription or prescription however you want to call it. not subscription sorry my bad prescription so doctor will give you a prescription then you go give it in the pharmacy and then collect medicines all this is one process right from the patient uh, getting into the hospital until the patient comes out of the hospital can you automate this entire process absolutely absolutely you can instead have a mobile application wherein you can book the uh, you know appointment you need not do it manually call them and check based on the available slot you go to the hospital when you talk with doctor doctor can use some kind of a bluetooth device and the entire conversation between you and the physician or between the patient and the doctor can be digitally recorded so you are automating the entire process then this information since it is digitally recorded in a database can automatically go to the pharmacy and the moment you walk to the pharmacy store your medicines are ready you just take you go collect your medicines and walk it you we also have integrated automation meaning say you as a patient are going to the hospital by your car okay you are traveling via car you can also register your car number in the mobile application when you do that the moment you are at the hospital gate it will automatically open and you can go into uh, the hospital parking area and also your gps or geofencing will guide you to the nearest available parking lot so that you go and park your vehicle what are you doing this is a completely different thing um you know helping you integrate your vehicle details in the mobile app you making use of computer vision to automatically detect your number plate and open the uh, barricade here and then guiding you to the nearest uh, parking lot all this is uh, i mean all this would uh, you know mean that you need a lot of other applications you can integrate all of that and you have ai automation ai automation simply put think about driverless cars driverless cars would actually help you perform the automation automatically and then we have a teapot which we will talk about this teapot uses a lot of machine learning algorithms and then figures out on what is the best machine learning algorithm say it uses an algorithm called as xg boost xg boost is one of the algorithms okay in this algorithm called as xg boost which is a machine learning algorithm you have a lot of hyperparameters such as booster verbosity validate parameters number of threads disable default evaluation metric number of p buffer number of features so if you really look at it 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 there are only seven hyperparameters you might say what what is the big deal in automating these i can remember these seven and i can solve it is what you might feel but then in exibust parameter uh, in this booster booster hyperparameter if you select the option as in all these you once again have different options that you can select okay in this booster if you select an option called gb tree then what happens is bunch of other hyperparameters come into picture 
all these eta value, gamma value, maximum depth, minimum child width, max delta step, bunch of options will come into play. And you need to select these options manually. First of all, you need to understand what each of those, each of those mean, right? You need to first of all understand what do we mean by gamma? What do we mean by something method? What do we mean by lambda, alpha? And what are the various options of each hyperparameter? You need to be first of all aware of all these things in order to manually select an experiment. However, auto ML can come to your rescue. You need not worry about any of these hyperparameters. You just use teapot, job done. I'll show you practically on how that works, okay? Teapot actually stands for tree-based pipeline optimization tool. Okay, and this teapot actually automates uh, the, these components which are in the gray color. Okay. So you take the raw data, you perform data cleansing. Data cleansing is something which is not performed by teapot, but then feature selection, feature processing, feature construction, selecting the right model, performing hyperparameter optimization. All of these are automated by teapot which is tree-based pipeline optimization tool. And then finally you get the validated model as output. Okay, so let's jump in and understand how these components can be automated. So that means model selection, model training, uh, hyperparameter tuning. If it is neural network, slight change we need to do. I'll explain you where we need to do that. But that is also something that can be performed. Okay. And finally, you deploy a model. Deployment has to happen manually, friends. For teapot, you, you can deploy the model manually. You can either decide on whether the deployment should support offline asynchronous or batch processing which we discussed in the previous module or online synchronous real-time deployment so you can decide these are the various options which your teapot uses different set of uh, machine learning algorithms which it uses okay and uh, it will also store the model predictions, right, as a new feature. And then these are the feature pre-processing steps, which it is going to experiment. And then here you have feature selection operations, which it is going to experiment with. All right. I think, yeah. Um, okay. A few more things and then will jump in. So friends, Teapot has a default option of trying out 100 different uh, pipelines or 100 different machine learning algorithms. And in each of that algorithm, it will experiment with a lot of hyperparameters. These are the default options. And even if this is the, these are the default options, then 100 into 100, which is 10,000. 10,000 different uh, pipelines is what Teapot is going to build by default. And, and hence, it is going to be time consuming. If it is time consuming, you might encounter an error which says the teapot optimizer did not converge because maybe the amount of time, uh, maybe you told, uh, I mean, you supplied to the model that 
you want the model to run for 15 minutes. It will run for 15 minutes and then it will stop. It might not uh, try out all the options within 15 minutes. And also, it might give you, Tpot might give you multiple optimal pipelines. Multiple pipelines which are optimized. Out of all of that, you need to choose the best pipeline. And Tpot can be used to handle regression, classification, parallel processing, neural networks, all of these tasks. Tpot can handle a bunch of these tasks. Okay. Next, we have the feature uh, tools. But before we get into feature tools, we need to get into the practicals. So I would be resorting to Google Colab. We'll write Python code in Google Colab. It'll be easy, right? There won't be any headache of installing softwares on your computer. So let me click on this. And within Google Colab, you have, I think, three options. One is a free option. Okay, you have uh, one option, which is a free option, wherein you can use the free resources. You have another option, which is Google Colab Pro. Okay, so it's not uh, taking me there, but then um, you, you can go to the option and then you can just figure out and then make the uh, payment. Here we go. You have uh, Collab Pro. Okay. And um, you also have Collab Pro Plus. I have Collab Pro. But you need not go for it, friends. You can use the free version as you use. Okay. When you open Google Collab for the first time, this is how it appears. Let me open it. Just to show you on how Google Collab appears. Uh, still loading, not sure why. Hmm. This is how it appears, right? I'll show you a few options here. If you just go here in this cell, if you say one plus one, and if you click on run, uh, you see here it says connect, right? When I click on run, it will start allocating a computer for you on the cloud. Google will start giving you a few computer, a free computer to process. I click on this. Look at this. It's saying connecting. It is saying initializing. That is your Python engine is getting initialized. And uh, 12 GB RAM and uh, 225 GB hard disk is allocated for you. I just forward my mouse on that and it says Python 3 Google Compute Engine is a backend, etc. And another option is go to runtime, click on change runtime type. And here you'll find two different options, GPU and TPU. GPU is something uh, which probably I would recommend you guys to consider. TPU is when you use TensorFlow library, that is when I recommend you to use that. So I'll select GPU and save it. If you want to run the next line, the moment you clicked on save, it is assigning you the GPU computer. Now, when you hover your mouse on this and click on that, you'll get two options, code, text. You also have it here, code, text. Wherever you want to add, you can just click on code and you can give the other options. Let me say eight multiplied by three. And if I click on run here, it will quickly give the answer. All right. Another option that I want to show you is click on this folder icon. The moment you click on that, here you'll see an option called Google Drive. So you click on this. Later, click on this. This is your drive. When you click on that, it is going to mount the Google Drive. It's mounting the Google Drive. Now you can say connect to. 
your Google Drive will start appearing here. Whatever files you have on your Google Drive can be accessed. Whatever files you have here, you can access them here. Okay. But yeah, it's taking a while. It's still mounting the Google Drive. I let it mount the Google Drive and then, yeah, it, it has done that. So here is my drive. When you go to my drive, you'll have all the folders and files pertaining to Google Drive. Uh, I mean, pertaining to your Google Drive. You can create a different folder. If this is a file that you want to access, you can access. If this is a file you want to access, you can. Right. So if you want to access any of these files, just right click, say copy path, not right click. Uh, just click on the three dotted lines and say copy path. That's how things work. Okay. The reason why I'm showing you this is because we will be making use of Google Collab to execute a few of the algorithms, right? So that's why I recommend you guys to understand these basic things. You also have text to be added. Say you're uploading data, uploading the data set. Okay using Python. In that way, you can put comments and then move on. So if, uh, the moment you have comments, it'll become easier and your code will be more readable. Friends, when uh, you attend interviews, two things happen. One is, in the first round of interview, usually people ask you about um, yourself. They'll say, tell me about yourself. They would ask you uh, theoretical questions on your projects that you worked upon, etc. And most often than not, as part of the second round of interview, they will give you a data set and business problem. And they'll give you 24 hours or so time and they'll ask you to solve it. Okay, and when you solve it, that means you need to write your code and give it to the interviewer. They are going to look at whether you have written the code in line with the best practice and do you have comments beside each line of code or for each line of code, do you have a comment on what that particular line does? Okay, so these are very, very important things. All right, so I'll stop here and uh, tomorrow it will just be hands-on. We have a teapot, I'm going to explain you each and everything on what teapot does and how you can make use of teapot and get the best code out. Thank you so much until then. And uh, uh, enjoy this learning. Thank you all friends. Bye.